Joining me live is a Shadow Infrastructure and Transport Regional Development Minister, Bridget McKenzie. She joins me live from Canberra. Bridget McKenzie, uh, good to see you. First of all, we knew this 90-day review was underway. Now we know that some projects uh, won't go ahead. Well, they'll be under review. Do you have a problem with that? Look, I absolutely do. I think Anthony Albanese touted himself as being the infrastructure prime minister on coming to government, but all we've seen is significant cuts and delays to uh, the $120 billion infrastructure pipeline uh, over the last year alone. They've cut uh, $5.5 billion from productivity enhancing, um, safety improving projects across the country. Now, they've announced a review. Uh, they are allowed to do that. They won the election. However, I have significant concerns about the independence of that review, given what's in and what's out. Uh, we've seen senior economists today very concerned about the lagging productivity across the mm. economy. The, you know, Australians have woken up this morning to the Reserve Bank, um, you know, with clear warnings about further interest rates on the, on the cards because of that lack of productivity. But one of the ways you actually deal with that is you invest in first and last mile road and rail uh, infrastructure projects and they're the types of projects uh, that the government has already cut or that are in the gun um, under this review. Let's look at wages as well because we've heard from several mm. unions uh, that want to see wages go up. We're having the uh, wage growth official data out in just about an hour from now. What is your view? What is the Coalition's view about how much the economy vis-a-vis um, -vis inflation uh, can afford wages to go up at the moment? Well, Australians are seeing real wages go backwards because of the inflation rate. Now, again, the way you address that is by increasing our productivity right across the economy uh, in the workplace. And it just seems every decision federal Labor is making, uh, whether it be in industrial relations, energy policy, or indeed my own area of infrastructure and transport, they are not putting downward pressure on inflation. They are not investing in the things that are going to increase productivity and therefore uh, assist with the task of cost of living pressures. And, you know, they've got to actually have a bit of a joined up policy perspective. I mean, one of the, you know, we've got these contradicting policy settings right across government. You know, on one hand, um, you know, we're wanting to uh, get skilled labour into the country um, and we're cutting infrastructure. On the other hand, we're bringing in one and a half thousand uh, new arrivals in the next five years without a plan. And I just think on every portfolio area, there seems to be a lack of overall vision on how to deal with this, these structural issues going forward. And that is evidenced by the RBA's warning in their minutes uh, that are being discussed today, uh, and also economists more broadly about the lack of investment by this government in, in projects like the beverage intermodal, which had, you know, over $100 million cut from it in the budget. Uh, in the a design project which was looking at how we can move product between Port Botany and Sydney Airport really quickly, things that are mm. going to help business be more efficient. Uh, these are the types of things this government is cutting and it's the wrong decisions at the wrong time. Uh, we just spoke to Simon Welsh from Red Bridge Group. He's doing a few focus groups. And, look, I wouldn't really normally worry about focus groups except it's, it's governments, it's oppositions that use these kinds of, this kind of information from focus groups to shape policies and, and messages. Essentially, uh, voters are happy with the spend on vulnerable people and there's not been a lot of cut-through from the, the opposition leader's budget in reply speech at this stage of the cycle, would you be worried about any of that? Uh, well, Laura, I'm in politics to make a difference for our nation and for mm. everyday Australians. So focus groups aside, the law of economics still apply. And I want people to be more prosperous going forward, not less. And that means the very real cost of living pressures that families and households are experiencing in our suburbs and our regions are going to continue unless Labor uh, gets their policy settings right. Now, I'm going to keep talking about that. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, if Labor keeps making the types of decisions they have in their last two budgets, uh, Australians are going to be worse off going forward. And 
you know, focus groups aside, we've got to change that so people are better off, not worse. And what is Bush saying? What are regional voters saying about this budget yeah. or are they just getting on with their lives? Well, that's what we do, but uh, I was out in Geelong and Ballarat yesterday um, talking about the infrastructure cuts in those communities and the concerns about, you know, putting an impost of $1.6 billion on our truck drivers, everything that uh, leaves the regions for markets mm. and everything that comes in uh, typically arrives on the back of the truck. So yeah. increasing... Well, it's funny that I you know, those... to the TWU, you may have caught some of that, and Michael Caine wasn't up in arms uh, about that, but truck drivers certainly have been, haven't well, they? Well, absolutely. Well, the TWU uh, isn't in running the businesses that employ uh, the union members. I've been talking to owner-operators of trucking businesses. We've got 55,000 truck businesses across the country, and they're the ones that are very concerned about $1.6 billion additional cost on their business bottom line when fuel's been going through the roof, parts and maintenance going through the roof. Mm. Uh, and that cost is just going to be pushed uh, down onto consumers. And we've also got the farmers' tax. So rural and regional Australia is feeling very, very much forgotten by the Labor government in their October budget when they slashed tens of billions of dollars from projects that were supposed to assist with the transition to net zero for regional communities. But in this budget as well, when there's specific taxes on our regional industries. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to ask you about that came up yesterday, and it's completely without notice, but I, know, I did see uh, that there was um, a, a story yesterday about uh, fast food businesses in regional Victoria, one in Wodonga, another in Shepparton, facing 124 criminal charges um, amid a crackdown by the state's child employment watchdog. Now, that headline is terrible. The wage inspector in Victoria said both... Uh, these businesses breached the Child Employment Act on various occasions, including employing children for more hours than they were allowed to work. Uh, the fines carry about $20,000. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of, of this case, but I know from spending a bit of time in the country that if you're under 15 or you're 14 and nine months, you do get a bit of uh, work on the side, uh, you do have a bit of time to do that. In fact, kids in the city should be doing it a bit more. O on face value, <laughs> looking at this um, case, um, I mean, it seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? These businesses facing $20,000 fines for potentially, you know, 14-year-olds working too many hours. Well, I'm not in favour of businesses breaking the law, Laura, and we have uh, really a high, high structure of um, mm. industrial relations law in this country that businesses should uh, give heed to. But I also grew up in a small business family in the regions and I've often made public comment that um, I don't think my dad abided by uh, any fair work rules with either the wage or the hours that I was subjected to participate in. <laughs> uh, but you are right about... Um, Culturally, in small country towns, typically people know each other, um, mm. parents know each other. And if it is, uh, if parents are consenting for their 14 uh, and nine month year old child to um, get a job early uh, than the 15 year olds, well, I think that is something that needs to be looked into. At the end of the day, we've got severe work shortages in the regions. Um, but we also need to make sure that nobody is exploited, including young people in our um, industrial relations system. So I'd need more detail because before I could specifically focus on these cases. Yeah, fair enough. I dropped that one in without notice, but it's certainly something that um, I reckon our, our viewers will be a bit exercised about because while the headline is bad, the reality might not be as much. So Bridget McKenzie, always good to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Thanks, Laura.